Okay, we're holding chapter 10, Sif 18, in the laws of Tefillin. So, Mylin Bakaydash Veloy Meridim. Principle, we will elevate a holy thing to a higher level of sanctity, but not diminish its level to a lower level of sanctity. Um, the Tefillin, where this comes up, uh, where else does this come up? Uh, we've had it before. Um, that's actually, oh, that's right. The Gemara gives that as one of the, one of the reasons why we light Hanukkah candles and we add another candle every night. So the, com- the famous reason is because we want a light corresponding to how many nights of Hanukkah there are. In other words, we're emphasizing that the, um, the miracle, you know, on the second day of Hanukkah, the miracle is an, an, it was an even greater miracle. It lasted for another day and another day. But a more, but an, an, an alternative reason given in the Gemara is this concept of the Mayan Bakhtedish Limerid, and we always seek to make things go to a higher level. So, the Tefillin Shalrosh is more sacred than the Shalyad because the Shalrosh is composed of four compartments. Each compartment contains a section of the Tefillin pertaining, of the Torah pertaining to Tefillin. And also the letter Shin. The letter Shin is on the outside of the head of Tefillin. And therefore, the strap that was part of the Shalrosh may not be used for the Shalyad, but the strap for the Shalyad may be used for the Shalrosh. Um, similarly, if the strap of the Shalyad tears above the knot, and you wish to reverse it and make the knot on the lower end of the strap, it is forbidden. But you must remake the knot on that end of the strap where the tear occurred, because that part of the strap is considered to be of a greater degree of sanctity, and therefore you cannot switch it around. Practically speaking, in any way, it wouldn't be very practical to try and take the strap of the head fill-in and make it into the strap for the hand fill-in, because it's, quite, it's usually much... Uh, I think often it would be much shorter, but anyway. The same applies to the strap of the Shalrosh. It is forbidden to reverse that which was inside the knotted area and remake it so that it is outside the knotted area. The same is true of a bag made to hold fill-in in which a bag, to, sorry, the same is true of a bag made to hold fill-in and in which a ba- the fill-in have actually been held. It is subsequently forbidden to use this bag for any secular purpose. Um... Now, so a couple of things. First of all, this you know, you people have different bags for the tefillin. You have the velvet bag which you put your tefillin in. You might have another velvet bag which your talus is in, and you put that one inside of that one, and then another plastic bag. What's referring to here is the only the bag which directly contains the tefillin. So that bag is a. A sort of a vessel for the tefillin. I mean, we we don't use it for other things. Um, if you made a stipulation before you put in the tefillin for the first time that you're going to use this for other things also, so then that's fine. And the Alter Rebbe says that because it's common, I don't know if it's still common, but because it's common for people to use it for other things as well. So it's just if you stipulated it. I don't know if nowadays it is considered common, but I know for myself, I know that before I put my tefillin into the bag, I stipulated that I could keep other things in the bag as well. And so, for example, I keep a mirror inside the bag of my tefillin. Um, some people like to keep uh, loose change to give to tzedakah or other things like that. Although... Perhaps one could argue, and I believe some do, that um, other items which are connected to a mitzvah, not just, you know, where you're going to keep your passport when you're traveling, yeah, that would be something which could be considered disrespectful unless you initially stipulated such. But if you're going to keep, a, you know, a gartel, a mirror for you to fill in, a siddur, a tehillim, things like that, there's more room to be in it. Okay. The tefillin should not be taken off, removed, until after the Kedusha of Avalatin, when we say, may it be your will, that we keep your statutes. So in the in the Avalatin, interesting. Last I hear of that, hold on. Um, in communities, I don't know. Okay, so there's the, the Kedusha of Avalotzian means like this. In, 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 in the prayer of Avalotzian, 
we say those the three verses that we say in Kedusha, which are Kaddish, 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 and Baruch Kveit Hashem Yim Kamei, and Yim Lech, and well, not Yim Lech, those two, Kaddish, 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 and Hashem Yim Lech Leinam Bayit, we say, yeah? Those three verses, which are sanctification, Kedusha, we recite them also again in Uval Etzien, together uh, with their Aramaic translation. So the children should not be removed until after the Kedusha of Uval Etzien. Now the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch himself adds that we should you should keep that, keep them on until a little bit further along within the prayer of Avalitzin, where we say the words Shanishmer Chukacha. You wrote from Fanach Hashem and Kesha Nishmer Chukacha Bo'ilu Mazet. May it be your will that we keep your statutes. Now the truth is that really um, we should keep it on for longer than that um, because. Uh, Al Pi Kabbalah, you're supposed to keep it on in, until the Kaddish after of Al Um After Al the Chatan says Kaddish. And Al Tarebbe also brings in Shulchan Aruch that the Arizal um, would keep the Tfilin on until after the end of Aleinu. The second paragraph of Aleinu is called Vialke in the Kabbalah. And the Arizal would keep his Tfilin on until after that paragraph. Um, so it's interesting to note a few things about this. First of all, uh, the Chabad custom is ideally to keep them on until after the end of Aleinu, the Alkan and the Al Rebbe says that even until the Kaddish after Aleinu. And um, it's also encouraged that in the Chabad Seder uh, order of prayer, we say the Tehillim for the day after the evening. It's certainly ideal to keep them on until the end of all the Kaddishim. At the end, after the Tehillim, there's another Kaddish to keep it on for all of that. That's sort of top of the line ideal, um, but certainly that, uh, to keep it on for the end of Aleinu and the Kaddish after Aleinu is a chumrah which Al Tanya explicitly, explicitly mentions in Shulchan Aruch. Um, but um, more important than that, if you're rushing, is to keep it on for the in, for Avalitzion and possibly, if possible, for the Kaddish after Avalitzion as well. Now, where this becomes relevant, besides when you're in a rush is two things. One is Rabbi Tam's Tfilin. So in other communities outside of Chabad, um, people who wear Rabbi Tam's Tfilin will take them off after Avalusian. And in many communities, they'll even take them off during the repetition of the Amida. You may find many Hasidic communities where during the repetition of the Amida, most of the congregation, obviously not the Chazan himself, but everybody else is switching from the Rashi to the Rabbi Tam's Tfilin. But our custom, the Chabad custom, is to be strict about wearing the Rashi Tfilin until at the very least after Avalot Siyan, and then, uh, and then, and only then taking them off and switching to Rabbi Natam's Tfilin. Now, it is important when wearing Rabbi Natam's Tfilin, uh, as we've mentioned in the past, and we're, we're going to be talking about this also more on the upcoming Sunday class with the history of Rabbi Natam's Tfilin, it's also important to put on Rabbi Natam's again, if possible, um, as close as possible, juxtaposing it to, the, to remove all of the Rashi Tfilin. So if you're going to, if you're rushing out and you need to make it out, then, then, then and it's a choice between wearing your, your Rashi Tfilin until after Tfil, after Tehillim or later on in the davening. And then, uh, you know, remembering to put on Meinu Tam's Tfilin later on in the day, then it would be recommended that take them off. Don't keep on your Tfilin for all they know. Keep, take off your Tfilin after the Valet Sion. And um, it, it's more important to put on a Meinu Tam's Tfilin right away than to keep on the Rashi Tzilin for the extra parts. Now, another time when this is important, I'm just looking ahead to see what he says. Yeah, so later on, the Kitta Shukhanar is going to say that on Rish Chaydash, the Tzilin are removed before the Musaf Amida, um, which is actually one of those things, which it's the import of Kabbalah onto Halacha, because it's uh, this this halacha is quoted by the Bish Yosef in the name of the Zohar, I believe. And it's one of the areas where there's no source for this in the Talmud. The only source for this is in Kabbalah. And yet it is one of those things which all communities across the spectrum of, 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 of Judaism um, do uh, keep this Kabbalistic custom to remove tefillin uh, before Musaf on, on Rish Chodesh. But even though we remove the tefillin before Musaf on Rish Chodesh, we have to keep the tefillin on for Oval Etzien, like it says here. And the way, right, so the way it works on Rish Chodesh, according to the Chabad custom, is after leaning, um, everybody says Oval Etzien, and then Rabbi Epstein announces, yeah, tefillin switcheroo. So 
um, but we keep our tefillin on for the Avon after the reading of the Torah. Um, in fact, there's a lengthy letter from the Rebbe of which the details I don't recall exactly, but there's a lengthy letter from the Rebbe explaining exactly why on Rish Chodesh it's important to take off the tefillin at exactly that point and not any earlier because there's a certain, Kabbalistically, there's a certain amount of Kadeshin that you're supposed to answer I mean, to while wearing your tefillin. And therefore we need to make sure that the tefillin, the Kaddish that's after, after, the of the, after reading of the Torah, there's a Kaddish that you're still wearing your Rashi tefillin for that Kaddish. Now, um, he's, that's because he's, we're gonna see in a minute that it's forbidden to take off the tefillin in the presence of the Sefer Torah. So on Rish Chodesh, you have to keep on your tefillin until after laning um, for two reasons. First of all, because you can't take it off in front of the Sefer Torah, but to that, there's obviously a workaround that you could just walk out of the room, which we'll see in a moment, um, but also because of the numbers of Kadeshim that you're supposed to answer in your Rashi tefillin. So everything of exactly when we take off the tefillin, the customs, everything is detail and there's much Kabbalistic significance to all of those uh, minutiae. Now, in communities where it is customary is that on the day that the Sefer Torah is read, the Sefer Torah is not returned until after the Kedush of Valetzian, which means after Valetzian, the tefillin should not be taken off until the Sefer Torah is returned to the Ark. A menomic, men, menomic, I don't know what that word means. Uh, let's see what the Hebrew word is. Similar double, right? A, a, a menomic, menom, yeah, that. For this order is that no, the Pasuk says that, that the king will pass in front of them and Hashem will be at their head. So basically, we don't take off the head to fill in until in front of the Sefer Torah. Now, it doesn't say it here, but if you, you're rushing or whatever it is, you need to take off your fill in. This is not on Rosh anytime. Anytime you need to take off your fill in in front of the Sefer Torah, then step out of the room for a moment and take them off. Um, I believe it may also say that you could sort of cover your head with your talis and remove them from under your talis without it being sort of visible, so to, so to speak, to the Sefer Torah. Um, now, what he means by this is, yeah, I, I'm not sure why this is unique to communities where the Sefer Torah is not returned until after Valesian, I think it's just practically speaking, like it, it, those communities, which is common practice of Minhagashkinaz, that they put the Sefer Torah away right immediately and afterwards they say about the Tzian. So then you, anyway, you, right, you, you won't be able to take off your Tzillin because like you said at the beginning of the paragraph that you ha- you say about the Tzian while wearing a Tzillin. Um, but those communities who put the Sefer Torah away after about the Tzian, so you finish about the Tzian, so you could say, I'll take off my Tzillin now, um, so he says, don't do it in the presence of the Sefer Torah. On the day when a bris is performed, the tefillin should not be removed until after the bris. Um, this is uh, is the common practice, although it is not the Chabad practice, um, but it is common practice in other communities that people keep that tefillin on for the bris, and certainly the, the moyal and the, the father of the child and those directly involved, but the Chabad custom is to take off tefillin before the bris. Um, on Rosh Chodesh, the tefillin are removed before the Musaf Amida, and um, those who wear Ben Tamis tefillin are also careful to put those on before the Musaf Amida on Rosh Chodesh, because in the Kedusha of Musaf, we say, Kesa Yitna Lecha, that we're giving a crown to Hashem, and it's not appropriate to, after that, put on your own crown. So we put on the tefillin before Musaf. Um, on in the intermediary days, Oh, one second. Another thing which it doesn't look like he's going to mention here um, is on Purim. That on Purim, we keep our tefillin on for the reading of the Megillah because it says in the Megillah, the, tefillin had, the, the Jews had those four expressions of light and jubilation and redemption. And the, the Gemara says that each one of those four expressions refers to a mitzvah, Eira is Torah, Eira is Torah, Simcha, I believe, is Yamtif, Sasain is circum- c- circumcision, and uh, Yukar is Tfilin. So that's why the custom here is to keep the Tfilin on for circumcision, because both the Tfilin and the circumcision are alluded to in that same verse. 
um, but also on Purim, because that Pasuk is mentioned in the Megillah, so on Purim morning, we keep our tefillin on for the reading of the Megillah. For most people, that's probably the longest day you ever keep on tefillin for so long, for the entire Shachra service and the reading of the Megillah um, is usually a good, you know, hour and 20 minutes or so. That's probably the longest an average person wears tefillin. Um, yeah. Okay. On Chalamayad of Sukkot, everyone removes the tefillin before Halil. On Chalamayad Pesach, the congregation removes it them before Halil. Second. Um, and the Chazan after Halil. Okay, this is not our minute because our minute is that we don't wear tefillin at all on Rish, on Chalamayad. Um, Not, I don't remember why there would be a difference between uh, taking off the tefillin. One second. On um, before on Pesach, the chasen should do it after halal. I don't remember that, but I do know that for those I don't know if there's anybody on the on the class right now whose custom it is to wear tefillin on Um but. Um, for those who wear tefillin on Chalamayat, um, many have the custom that on the first day of Pesach, they keep the tefillin on until after the reading of the Torah, because the reading of the Torah for the first day of Chalamayat Sukkot is the end of Parshish Goy, Exodus chapter 13, which records the mitzvah of tefillin. But either way, um, let's move on. Oh, one more thing that's relevant is that if mentioned before that you keep all your tefillin, all, you finish with all the tefillin before Musaf on Rish Chedesh. What if you're not holding up with a minion and you're, the minion saying Musaf and you are still wearing your tefillin? So then you should move your tefillin off to the side. So they should be out of space. If your tefillin are not directly in the middle, it's not kosher. Um, so you move them off to the side or alternatively you could cover them. Um, while you say those words of Kedusha that you're giving a crown to Hashem. But again, that's not the ideal. The ideal is that you should be finished with all the tefillin for the day um, before Moses. Um, okay, I don't seem like he's going to mention this, or maybe mentioned it already earlier, but I don't think we've pointed this out yet, that the Alter Rebbe is quite strict. Um, about um, making sure that when the tefillin are in the right place, in the middle of the head, that they are exactly in the middle. That's why we we, we even have a custom to use a mirror to make sure it's exact. Okay. The tefillin are removed while standing. You should unwind the coils from the middle finger and two or three coils from the arm. And then the shalroish is removed first, and then the shaliyad, because it is written that they shall be for the toughest between your eyes, since it says they shall be in the plural towns and shades of blessed memory list that as long as the shalroish is between your eyes, both tefillin should be on you. That, right? So ideally, you never want to have tefillin on the head with no, and not have tefillin on your arm at that time. So that's why we take off the head tefillin first. Therefore, you should put on the tefillin shaliyad first and remove the shalroish first, so that whenever the shalroish is on you, the shaliyad should also be. Um, should also be on you. Now, those who have the custom to put on the shaliyat tefillin sitting down, so they would also remove the shaliyat tefillin sitting down. That's the Sfardi custom. And it's also said, brought down that the Chabad Rabbeim would do that, but it says explicitly that the Hiroyal Rabbim is the, the, the ruling for the public is to put on and take off all tefillin standing up. Should remove the shall raise for them with the left hand, which is the weak hand, in order to demonstrate that you're reluctant to remove them. Because ideally, um, the mitzvah is to wear the for the entire day. But because our bodies are not always clean, we remove them immediately after prayers. Um, we have a similar custom: is when we take the three steps back after the amida, you do the first step. You start with your left foot to illustrate that you're reluctance to remove, uh, to, to step back from conversation, from, from, uh, from, from Philip. Now, oh, here we go. I said this already before. You should not remove the Tefillin in the presence of the Tefillin, nor in the presence of your Rebbe, but you should turn aside and remove them. It is custom ordained by the Chachamim to kiss the Tefillin when putting them on and taking them off. You should not remove the Talis until after taking the Tefillin off. 
Um, okay. Oh, here's the thing he mentions. Interesting that. Um, It's brought in Kabbalah that before you put on the, t the, the head tefillin, you should look at both sides of the, uh, the two shins on the side of the head tefillin. Um, and the reason he brings for that is that the, the, those two shins represent the 613 mitzvahs, because two shins together is 600. And you have one of the shins has three head shafts, the other has four, so that's seven. Um, and or maybe it means the seven surrounding i don't know somehow the somehow those two shins uh have seven and six in them so it reminds you of 613. um if i recall correctly there's a letter from the rebbe that says we should not do that because if you are aware of the whole kabbalistic meaning of looking at the head uh, the shin of the head for then then that's all good but if not then it's not, then essentially it's not directly related to putting on tefillin, and that would, um, that would, uh, that would be like a separation, uh, sorry, an interruption in between the bracha and the putting on the tefillin. So you should not stop and pause to look at the shins before you put on the head tefillin, but the Rebbe suggests um, you could fulfill that idea by looking at the shins when you take off the tefillin before you put them away. So again, I hope I'm repeating that letter of the Rebbe correctly. Now, the tefillin should be placed inside their bag in a way that you'll be certain the next day to take out the shaliyad first. Um, because, like, because we aim mavir on the mitzvah, we had this before, you never pass over the mitzvah. So you want to make sure you pick, and you have to put on the hand for them first. So you want to make sure you put it in a way that you're going to take out the hand for them first. So it's not like you take them both out. And then, you know, you first you make sure you always have the shaliyad on the left and the shalrish on the right. And like this, you automatically go for the hand filling first. However, you should not place the shell on top of the shell yard. Um, sorry, you should not place the shell yard on top of the shell rush because the shell rush is more sacred than the shell yard, but they should be placed side by side. So, this is actually one of the uh, in Israel, it's quite common. People have like this um, bulletproof container um, where they keep the filling in. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but um, it's not ideal to use such a thing because um, you're gonna because the way that one is designed. The hand filling goes on top of the head filling. Um, okay, this is not a, a strict obligation, it's just a preference. Anyway, the filling bag should be placed inside the talus bag below the talus. The talus should be on top in order that the talus is first at hand. Again, because we need to put on the talus first and we don't want to pass over it. Um, the, um, where was I? Yeah, a, a similar thing, like we said before, you have the shalyad next to, on the left, next to the shalosh, in a way that you know which one you're going to reach to first, is the same idea is between the Rashi and the Rabbein Otam, that the Rashi and the Rabbein Otam should be placed, I think it's common to put the Rashi on the left, Rabbein Otam on the right, it could be the other way around too, as long as you know where you keep them, so that when you stick your hand in, you're going to pull out the right bag first. If you have no tefillin, and arrived at the shul when the congregation is already praying, it is preferable to wait until the end of prayer and then borrow tefillin from someone else in order to say the Shema and while wearing tefillin, rather than pray with the minion without wearing tefillin. However, if you are afraid that the time limit for Shema will elapse before you find tefillin, you should recite the Shema without tefillin. So what that means is like this. The halacha is that it's uh, forbidden to recite the Shema without tefillin because you're proclaiming self, false testimony about yourself 
you're proclaiming that you have to do the mitzvahs for them and you're not doing it. But, so that's Lechatchila. Lechatchila, you, you should always say Shema first with Tzillin. And I think we've mentioned in one of the past Kutzah classes that um, there is even a custom, which some very devout Jews do, that when they say the Shema before prayer, they say it with Tzillin. But, but, the, the, but, but that's the ideal way. But strictly speaking, if you say the Shema without Tzillin, and um, you're going to put on tefillin and say Shema again later, that's fine. That's not considered saying self false testimony about yourself because you're just saying the Shema now because the time is going to pass and afterwards you're going to put on tefillin. If you're afraid that the prayer for, for the time limit for prayer will also elapse, you should also pray without tefillin and later when you find tefillin, put, whoops, sorry, put them on, pronouncing the required brachos and then recite a to heal him or put them on for Munich, etc. However, the night is not the proper time to wear its filling. It's forbidden to put them on at night. It's permissible to take someone else's filling even without his knowledge in order to put them on and recite the brachas over them as mentioned in the previous chapter with regarding to a talus. Um, now, again, when you, if you're borrowing somebody else's filling, um, you make sure that the tefillin shall rush fit you um, in a way that the, both the knot and the bias of the tefillin are in the appropriate places. If it's much too big or, you know, a little bit, you could have some leeway. But if it's much too big or much too small, it must be changed. And um, usually, hopefully, there'll be somebody around to show you how to change it. Or if not, I'm sure that you could find on YouTube very easy videos. But essentially, I'll just describe it, that the the the... the the head's tefillin, really, if you analyze it, you will see that it's basically just like the right strap that goes around your head on this side um, is just looping around the knot. So the, the bulk of the knot is made from the left side, and the right one just goes into the knot, up, and back around the back. So if you need to make it bigger, you just need to pull out those two sides of the loop and tug it a bit in that direction and then in the other direction. Now, of course, you don't want to borrow somebody's tulin and then make it bigger or smaller, and then the next day he's going to find his and certainly if you're taking it without his knowledge. Um, so it's important to make sure to change it back to the right size. And usually, um, you know, the, 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 the spot of the strap, which is used for the knot, has a, has a sort of a mark in it that you could tell where it was. So it's usually not too difficult to put it back to the right size. Okay. Tfilin Srikhan Gufnaki. One who wears Tfilin must have a clean body and must be careful not to flatulate while wearing them. A person suffering from diarrhea, although he has no actual pain, is exempt from the midst of Tfilin because in he's incapable of keeping himself properly clean. If he feels that he will be able to keep his body clean just for a short amount of time to recite reading the Shaman during the Shaman Esra, then he should put on Tfilin for that. Regarding any other sick person, if he suffers pain from a sickness and his mind is not at ease because of his pain, he's exempt from the mitzvah because it's forbidden to divert, divert his attention from the tefillin. But if he is not in pain, he must put them on. Um, also, it's interesting, he doesn't say this here. Come on. Okay, it's also forbidden to yawn in tefillin, um, but if you're yawning, it says that you could just cover up your mouth in a way that it's not obvious that you're yawning. Um, but if you need to pass wind, then it's you don't you can't just say um, you know cover it with your hand because that's not respectful to do that while you're wearing tefillin. So you really have to try your best um, to hold it in. Um, or I guess technically you could, if you can control it, then you could move your tefillin off to the side so that you're not, it's not considered that you're wearing the, hand, the head tefillin and do something similar with the hand tefillin um, and then adjust them back if that becomes necessary. Okay. Okay, so it's interesting over here. When it comes to a child, um, usually, Every mitzvah, what age does a child have to begin doing the mitzvah? So we teach our children to, to say brachas and to daven and to bench and uh, to shake lulav and to hear shayfa and to eat in the sukkah. We, it's called the mitzvah of chinuch, to educate our children to do all the mitzvahs. 
So the age that's appropriate to do every bit for chinuch is whatever age a child is able to do the mitzvah. So once a child is old enough to shake lulav properly, he should make sure he fulfills the mitzvah of lulav. Once he's old enough to um, eat a kazais of matzah, yeah. So what's the age of tefillin? So he says like this, when a minor, a, ch- a minor means a cotton child on the bar mitzvah, knows how to care for tefillin properly, um, not to uh, flatulate while wearing them, not to pass wind while wearing them, and not to sleep while wearing them, um, and also uh, uh, not to go into the bathroom with them. His father is obligated to purchase tefillin for him to put on. It is now the prevailing custom, however, that a child begins putting on tefillin two or three months prior to his becoming 13 years old. And um, that is indeed the Chabad custom to do it two months. There are some communities where they do it one month, and there are even some communities where the minag is that they, no, they don't put on tefillin even one extra day before the bar mitzvah. But the Chabad custom is in accordance with this. We put on tefillin two days before the bar mitzvah in fulfillment of the mitzvah, bar mitzvah, in fulfillment of the mitzvah of chinuch. Um, Did we talk about making a bracha on the tefillin if you go, take them off to go to the bathroom? Didn't we mention that in the past? Okay, anyway, practically speaking, I don't remember if this came up in the past. Uh, practically speaking, the custom is that if you take off your tefillin to go to the bathroom for ketanim, to urinate, then when you come back, you don't make another bracha on the tefillin. But if you take them off for um then to for bowel movement, then you do make a bracha when you put them back on. Um, if it's already the end of davening and you're after volunteer, then you don't need to put them back on and you just go straight to putting on many times. And of course, you don't make a bracha. Um, OK. I'm actually interested to note that I, the Frida Kareba um, did wear tefillin privately for two years before his mitzvah. And I believe that amongst the Sephardim, there are many who have that minhag that um, even, uh, you know, from the age of 10, 11, 12, you know, so once a child is able to control his body, he puts on tefillin. Incidentally, this is also the main reason, I don't think it's the only reason, but it's certainly the main reason why women don't wear tefillin. Because even though, in other words, like this, um, women are allowed to, and in many cases even encouraged, to fulfill mitzvahs that are time-bound. Now, tefillin is a time-bound positive mitzvah. It only applies um, during the daytime, not at night, and it doesn't apply on Shabbos and Yom Tif, so it's time-bound, um, and therefore women are exempt from tefillin. But whereas shoifer, for example, which we do encourage women to go and hear shoifer, women are discouraged, strongly discouraged from putting on tefillin. And the reason is because um, wearing tefillin requires uh, first of all, Nikoyan Haguf, the body has to be clean. And also, like we discussed last week, requires focus of Kavana, of your, your mind has to be constantly on the tefillin. So, whereas, as far as a man is concerned who's obligated to put on tefillin, so you say, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able, my thoughts might, uh, might, might uh, wander sometimes. Okay, but even if your thoughts wander, you, um, you're still obligated to wear it filling and as much as possible you control your thoughts. Similarly, if you're, if you're not 100% sure, um, yeah, you might, it might happen sometimes, it probably happens to most people sometimes that they pass wind during the wearing the tefillin, but that wouldn't be a reason never to fulfill the mitzvah of wearing tefillin. But for a woman, because she's not obligated to do it, so we advise her not to opt into doing it. Um, that's the primary reason why women don't wear, um, do not wear tefillin. Okay, with regards to putting on filling on the Chalamoyed of uh, Chalam, on intermediate days of Yom Tov, Chalamoyed Sukkot, Chalamoyed Pesach, there is a dispute among the authorities and there are various customs. Some communities hold like those authorities who maintain not to wear them at all. Other communities hold like those authorities who maintain that they should be worn but without reciting a brach over them, allowed in the shul as is done on the other days of the year. Other communities have a custom to put them on without reciting brachas at all. The person should bear in mind that if the Chalamoyed days are not the proper time for tefillin, the tefillin should be considered as ordinary straps. What does that mean? One second. Ah, that he has in mind, according to this, one of the customs, when you put on tefillin a cholamayid, you have in mind, if I'm doing a mitzvah, then this is, a, if there's a mitzvah to put on tefillin a cholamayid, then this is a mitzvah. And if not, then it's just, should be considered as if I'm just playing around with some pieces of leather. 
Even though you do not recite the brachas, nevertheless, it's forbidden to interrupt between putting on the shaliyad and the shalroish, as we said um, last week. However, you may interrupt for Kaddish and Kedusha. Care must be taken that among the worshippers in any one synagogue, there should not be some people who put on tefillin and some people who don't. Um, this seems to be the correct way, because otherwise there would certainly be a problem of loisus goydudu. Okay, so... This last piece, of course, um, it is a Chabad custom not to wear it for the Nechalamayid. It's also in Eretz Yisrael. It's a custom of everyone not to wear it for them. But amongst non-Chabad or non-Chassidic communities, amongst non-Chassidic communities outside of Israel, there are many who do have the custom to wear it for the Nechalamayid, and they do all different variations that he mentioned here. Some do with the bracha, some without a bracha, some with the bracha quietly. Um, now, this last piece over here of Reis Yisraelidu, is basically the mitzvah of the Yishis Kodudu, one of the interpretations of it is um, that you should never have two people doing different contradictory customs together. So you don't want to have, so in, in this case, uh, you don't want to have some people wearing tefillin and some people not wearing tefillin and shul. Um, Lemaisa, um, it's customary nowadays, in, in many shuls, it's customary to be lenient about this. In other words, like this. In some shuls nowadays, the minhag is that we do, they don't, you don't wear tefillin and chalamayid. And if you want to wear tefillin and chalamayid, then you can't come into shul. So, for example, I remember once a few years ago, I was davening, I was in chalamayid Pesach um, in Manchester for a day. Um, so in the shul over there, and I think it was in the Maxik Hadash shul, there was the, 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 they opened up the women's section. And anybody who wanted to wear daven with tefillin went to daven in the women's section. But in the main shul, nobody was allowed to wear tefillin. And that is the simple reading of the of, of the halacha that it says here. Um, the same is true the other way around. According to the simple reading, even if it's my custom not to wear tefillin and chalamayid, if for whatever reason I'm davening in a shul where everybody is wearing tefillin, then according to the simple reason, reading of this, uh, the simple understanding of the halacha, um, I would have to wear tefillin in order not to be different than everybody else. Practically speaking, though, nowadays many poskim are lenient about this, and they say that it's okay to wear its fill-in in a shul where the minhag is not too, and that's here in Beis Menachem, usually in Chalamayid, there'll always be, you know, one per, whatever, it's a convenient time, people come here who have followed Minhag Ashkenaz, who do wear its fill-in in Chalamayid, and nobody asks them to leave the shul. Um, now, the other way around, for, for, for if I'm going to go to Davin in Nusach Ashkenaz shul and not wear its fill-in, is even more room to be lenient because if you're going in a shul when the minag is not to wear tefillin and you come and wear tefillin, then you're sort of publicly demonstrating that you're doing a different custom than everybody else around here. Whereas if everybody is wearing tefillin and I'm not wearing tefillin, it's not intrinsically obvious and that I'm doing a different custom. It could be that I'm not wearing tefillin because uh, I have diarrhea. And like you said before, if somebody has diarrhea, you don't wear tefillin. So there could be other external reasons why I would not be wearing tefillin other than following a different custom. Whereas to wear tefillin when the custom is not to, um, uh, it's, it's more it's it's more reason to be concerned with loisus kodidu. But nevertheless, like I said, nowadays many are lenient about this in both directions. Okay, once tefillin are assumed to be kosher, and then according to halacha, as long as the bias itself is in perfect condition, the scrolls inside are also presumed to be kosher and do not require examination. Um, and the Gemara famously says um, that, uh, who was it? Huda ben Maseir, I think, who said that he had the tefillin from his uh, grandfather that were never checked. Nevertheless, it is proper to examine them because sometimes they become spoiled become, because of perspiration and the moisture um, gets into it, and the heat, and the cold, there could sorts of be all sorts of external reasons why tefillin would be become possible, even though there may not be any visible deterioration to the external box of the tefillin. And if you wear them only periodically, they require examination two times every seven years because they may have become moldy. Also, if the bias toward the scrolls also um, require examination. This also applies if they were soaked in water, right? So if something traumatic happened to them, you for sure want to check them. Nevertheless, if there's no competent person to examine the scrolls and to be sewed at fill-in, you may wear them without examination in order not to negate the mitzvah, but should not recite the brachas over them. Um, that means if you have fill-in that are uh, severely damaged, that you can tell from the outside that they're damaged, and you don't have anybody available to check them, then you can continue wearing them until you find somebody to check them without the bracha. Of course, nowadays, um, with UPS, you can always find somebody to check them.
Um, uh, we all know that the Rebbe very much encouraged people to check the tefillin um, often and certainly much more than is um, explicitly required by halacha and up to one, uh, even the Rebbe sometimes spoke about checking them every month, although I have heard from some scribes, even Lubavitchers, that they don't recommend checking your tefillin every year because the frequent opening and closing of the tefillin um, does cause them damage. I'm not sure exactly what to make of that and if that fits or how that fits with the Rebbe's directive to check tefillin regularly. Um, so I'm going to plead ignorance. Okay, I guess we'll pause here and then next week we'll start chapter 11, which is the laws of mezuzah. Any questions before we sign off? That's not.